Hi, I'm Nina Atchison and welcome to Teachers Talk, where we explore the lives of real teachers in Australia today. I have with me Dean Bennetts, Principal at Central Coast Adventist School. Dean, welcome. Nice to be here. It's great to have you. Dean, I understand that you're principal of one of our largest schools in Australia and I just want to hear a little bit about your background and your journey as, um, as a person and as an educator in our schools. So tell me a little bit about your upbringing. Well, surprisingly, even though I live now in, in suburbia and I'm looking after, a, as you said, one of our larger schools in Australia, a career in education, uh, living in the city, none of this ever factored in my thinking. Really? Yes. I, uh, I, in fact, I probably at age two through three or four uh, was only a kilometre from where we're videoing today in a little rural town, uh, right. launching place not far from here where my dad was a log truck driver. And uh, after that, we moved to Gippsland where he took up dairy farming. And so most of my memory of being uh, a young person, then certainly through my teen years uh, before I went to Avondale College, was that of being a dairy farmer's son. Wow. So you never thought you'd go into teaching or, or was there something that prompted or inspired you to, to get into that? I, look, I think it'd be fair to say that teaching and myself were never an aligned career choice. Uh, look, I, I enjoyed school. Uh, I went to a, a small state primary school, about 35 students and... Uh, uh, graduated from that at year six as you do and moved off to a consolidated state high school at Druin. Uh, there was I'd say about 1100, 1200 students there and while school for me uh, was a journey that I, I went through it, it never really ticked all my boxes. I, I never imagined going into a, a teaching career. Uh, a lot of my relatives had had uh, uh, careers in the armed forces in different sort of areas and, and part of my thinking even was that perhaps the armed forces was a direction. Mm. Uh, I am an, I'm an art teacher by training uh, right. and so uh, the inference being yeah, I did enjoy art and graphic design and that sort of thing at school and I even thought about architecture as something that I would like to do. Right. But as it happened, uh, yeah, none of those choices panned out. And I hear you're very passionate about a couple of things. What, what, what's one of those things that you're passionate about? Uh, look, I have to be completely honest. The, even wearing my tie today, <laughs> the, uh, the tie of the Essendon Football yes. Club uh, in the <laughs> AFL here in Australia. And uh, look, I, I say to people that I, I bleed red and black. Uh, I uh, am very passionate about supporting my team, have always done that. Uh, I have a, a son and a daughter and a wife that have not had any choice about the team that they support. <laughs> if they wanted to stay in the home, they needed to support <laughs> right. the Essendon Football Club. Yeah. And uh, look, we, are, we, we go to games uh, we, and when we go, we're in our full war paint and we have our, our clothes all in red and black. And it's something that, uh, that I've always enjoyed. I, I played footy at school yeah. uh, and uh, have always enjoyed AFL and it's something that I, I certainly do fly my flag for. But I think in many ways I use that as an object lesson mm. because you, you ask for two things. Well, the other thing that I'm passionate about is my faith, is the fact that if I in my humanity am prepared to wear a tie that really is only representing a bunch of blokes that run around in tight shorts kicking some inflated object, which when you think about it has no merit, meaning or purpose. Mm. You know, if I can be that wound up, and I do get wound up yeah. about my footy, but if I can get that wound up about that, then I think it is beholding upon me to exceed that when it comes to the passion I have for God. Mm. Because he needs to inhabit that part in our lives where we have this massive gap that we don't know how to fill. And I love how, how people refer to it, Lou Giglio and others refer to it as being that God hole. Yeah. That the only thing that can fill it no matter what we try and put in it, is a relationship with God, yeah. is a connection with Him, is understanding the sacrifice that Jesus has made. And so if I can, if I can wear my red and black colours, you know, I, I really uh, want to hopefully be seen as someone then that also wears the robe of Christ with equal passion. Mm, that's great. What a great illustration and object lesson. Thank you for sharing that. No, you're welcome. Um, so tell me, you, you taught for a couple of years in, in art, did you? Or, or where did you end up? Av you went to Avondale first of all, did you? Yeah, look, and, and probably take a step back. I ended up at Avondale because my mother is sneaky. Uh, <laughs> I, 
And I'm happy to go on record for saying that. Yeah. She knows that. Yeah. Uh, look, I, again, going to a, a state school, um, as I said, 11, 1,200 kids, two Adventists, three Adventists max that ever attended at any one time. Mm. I went to a, uh, a very small rural country church of around 35 members. Uh, I would say 90% of those were my relatives. Yeah. And so my, my Adventist network, if I can use that phrase, of people that I knew inside the faith was really small. And even in context, being small, a vast majority were my relatives, as I said. Yeah, Not yeah. a bad thing. I mean, I think for me, it is, is ultimately underwritten. One of my core passions also is family. You know, I'm just so family driven. Yes. Uh, and I think that results from that. But, you know, I, I got to the final years of my schooling, wasn't really making uh, good choices. I, I didn't I didn't study that well. I hope my son and daughter aren't listening because they need to. Uh, <laughs> And got to the point where, yeah, I, yeah, I finished my HSC, but was really unsure as to what to do next. And I ended up agreeing to the negotiations and nagging of my mother to have 12 months at Avondale College. And so uh, I went to Avondale College and I, and I still remember lining up that first day to sign up basically for general studies or maybe the flying course, something yeah. like that, just to do for 12 months. And uh, a lecturer there at the time, uh, Marty Willis, uh, and he probably won't even remember the conversation, but he walked up to my family and I and said, uh, oh, introduced himself, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm just filling in for the year. Asked me what I did at school and I explained that I did art. And he said, well, have you considered doing teaching? And I said, not a chance. I said, I'm happy to be out of school. I don't want to go back again. And he made a comment to me and back then that if you did teaching, you got uh, government subsidy yeah. and, and support. And so straight away, my head's gone, oh, hang on. I can save money here. Yeah. <laughs> if I spend 12 months doing some art subjects, so I can save up some money, buy my first car, this is all sounding really good. And so that is the platform for my decision to go into teaching. Right. I, I made the decision standing in that line to do art teaching. And now 23, 24 years later, I'm sitting here having this interview, which yeah. has been a real ride because I never, ever considered, planned, thought of education as a career path. I want to ask you more about that in a minute. Don't go away. We'll be back in a moment.
Hi, welcome back to Teachers Talk. Dean, tell me a bit about what did you do after Avondale? Did you go into teaching or did you do something else? Look, I did end up graduating and I really want to honour my mum at this point because I know that without her dogged determination and focus to convince me to go for that 12 months, the rest of the journey may never have happened. And so, you know, I don't know if she's watching, but I do want to say to her that she was an instrument of God. I have no doubt that you, my mother, were an instrument to God to get me to go. And, uh, and, and it means a lot to me because it's given me everything. Mm. Uh, a, a wife who I love, Trace, uh, my son and my daughter, and, and the whole journey started with that in, yeah. in my headspace. Yeah, yeah. I graduated and as it was at that time, I was told there were no jobs for me. Um, and it wasn't because I was a poor student, it was just that there were a lot of art teachers graduating at that point. And uh, I did end up getting an offer of a position back here in Victoria at Lilydale Academy, uh, teaching pretty much everything except what I was trained in. And uh, look, I, I took it up because I, I thought of the option of returning to the farm and, and I, I weighed it up and went, well, you know, I've invested four years yeah. and, and I'm starting to feel that there is something that I'm meant to do. I didn't have a handle on it, but I had a sense that it was something that I should do. So I ended up going to Lilydale, was there eight years. Uh, we had, uh, had probably two years just general teaching, uh, two years as the assistant boys dean and somewhere in there in that four year, three, four year time frame, uh, I ended up being deputy principal and uh, was DP through to 97. Right. And so 97, my family and I uh, left and went to Central Coast Adventist School. Wow, you've got a lot of drive. So tell me about what was Central Coast Adventist School like when you initially went there and, and you know, in comparison to how it is now, I think yeah. it's changed quite a bit. I certainly don't have any grand illusions as to any man-made manoeuvre that got me there because I do know that uh, I think I was into the double figures of pe people being asked down the list by the time they got to my name. <laughs> and, and look, I understand because you know, at that particular point in time, uh, the school was facing challenges. Uh, it was not seen as a growth school and, you know, would have been 120, maybe 130 kids, K to 10, right. seven or eight staff. Mm. And uh, I guess for the more, uh, I guess for those staff members or, or um, principals in training that had aspirations for bigger schools, it was always being overlooked. And uh, I had a friend there, Graham Harris, and uh, he sent me just a photo of the school with some things written down when he heard that I'd been asked. And he just made some really really good comments about, and he sent me a video as well, just some comments about he had a sense that there was something happening inside the school. Mm. And so my wife and I investigated it and we prayed about it. And in the end, we took up the opportunity. So in 97, 98, we moved to Central Coast uh, to the Gosford region. Yes. Uh, we bought, well, we rented a home in Erina about 800 metres from the school, which proved providential because I don't think any of us could have predicted what was about to happen. And, uh, and so being that close to school allowed me to be there a fair bit in those early years. And so I arrived there as a teaching principal, three quarter teaching load and the rest administration. Right. So where has the journey gone from since then? Has, you know, the school now is around, as you said before, thousand students. That's a huge growth in, in a period of, you know, 10 or more years. What's happened over that time? Uh, the simple answer is, we just let God do his work. Yeah. And, I, and I don't mean that as a throwaway line. Yeah. Uh, I go back to the founding fathers of that school and there is a story and it's a true story written into the school minutes that shows of these foundation families meeting in prayer over a series of weeks and months praying about should a school be started on the central coast of New South Wales, which was a trying to compare it to be some, like a, a rural beachside town you yeah. know that was hours to get to and the school commenced through donated money and time and labor of all of these families and it started to replicate that same experience in the mid 90s where the current families again met in prayer uh, and at the council level and said you know what are we meant to do because as a k-10 school the school was going backwards because no one wanted to join a high school where in three or four years time you had to change to another local school. Mm. So it really was either be a good primary school or go the whole step 
K to 12. And so based in prayer, based in faith, uh, the school stepped out and uh, and it's just been an incredible spiritual ride yeah. ever since. And, and not meaning it's been a, a mountaintop experience the whole way. Far from it. it tell, has been, tell me some of these, you know, some of the low moments because I know you've had a few at, at the school. What comes to mind for me when I think of this is over the last five years, there's been three examples where the school has and I've been required as the principal, and, and it's certainly something that I never envisage being required to do, have had to stand beside the gravesides of senior students. And for me, not that there's a list, but we've ticked off the big three as far as I'm concerned. We've, we've you know, buried students because of uh, disease, because of accident, and because of murder. Mm. And without a firm understanding that God is with us. You know, he may not remove the storms, but he's going to carry us through the storms. I, I ha honestly have no idea how personally and even structurally the school could have coped with those experiences because, you know, you take both the murder and the accident were just so instantaneous. Really? Uh, I, I know where I was at the time uh, the murder took place. I know what I was doing at my desk. I, I know the sounds. I remember sitting at my desk hearing these sirens and thinking, my goodness, what are all the sirens going on for? I thought, oh, I hope that's not an accident down the road. Little do I know is it's one of our students less than a, a couple of k's from, from school going home. And, and something happens in the school environment, I think, when the reality of spiritual warfare bursts into our awareness. Mm. Because I do see it that way. I do see that, that the more we put a stake in the ground and fly a flag for our saviour, the more Satan wants to send his darts at us. I do believe that fervently. Absolutely. And, and I know that when I watch what happened inside the school over those series of events, as I said, where incredible manifestations of trust come out of it you know because my first thought was that perhaps this will be the end of us perhaps we won't be able to process our way through it but when you end up with the net result of senior students building prayer cells together 24 7 prayer rosters operating where at any time in the day and this only just happened recently again with another young lady that passed away through illness. The school, there's this 24 seven prayer roster happening that at two o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the afternoon, midnight, there are groups of people praying into the situation. Wow. Uh, and these manifestations then take place around the campus where you've got kids willing and comfortable and able just to go up hand on shoulder and pray. I mean, we're talking about a school and keep in mind, 70% of my school is non-Adventist. Yeah. I'm not talking about a purely Adventist enrollment. I'm talking about a, a school enrollment that comes together under a banner of valuing Jesus and wanting to see Christ embedded in their life. And it's not divided up on faith lines at that point. It's, it's based around just wanting to have that connection. And so... As I said, whilst they didn't break us, I think they certainly made us those experiences uh, because it has helped gel for us as a school community what's important. Dean, how challenging for you to have to deal with um, these kind of things as a principal. I, I can't imagine the, the many elements to it, the parents, the families, the students, the staff. Um, so I, I'm sure that it sounds like God was really there as a rock of strength for you during Absolutely. that time. So Absolutely. praise him for that. Yes. Please don't go away. We'll be back in a moment.
Hi, welcome back to Teachers Talk, where we're sharing some time with Dean Bennetts. Dean, can you tell me, how do you think your school serves the mission of the church? Well, my first comment is that I'm excited by the fact that the mission of the church and the mission of the school work hand in hand. It is the same mission, and that is to build God's kingdom. And that is core in all that we do. Yeah. Uh, I had uh, an employee once that was head of my primary school, uh, Leon Miller. And I remember as we were growing, I was having this real point of tension between the money that we were spending on a very intentional chaplaincy program. Uh, we employ at the moment close to six employees that are based just in chaplaincy, that are dealing with chaplaincy areas, worship ministry, um, student pastoral care support, all that sort of thing. And I was lamenting one day to Leon about trying to balance the budget. And Leon said to me, you spend God's money on God's stuff and he'll look after the rest. And, and it's so true. And, and I've taken that to heart because as we have, and we are, we, we are a Christian business, you know, and we explain what the school is about. We need money to exist, but we seriously invest God's money in his mission. And we do see the support that he gives us as a result. You know, there are things that as we've got bigger that we've been able to do. For example, we have uh, a campus church that operates at school and uh, it on any given Sabbath would have a close to 50% attendance from the non-Adventist contingent inside the school that are there worshipping, wow. fully worshipping, um, participating in song services, um, participating in prayer groups, going to Bible study programs in the morning. Uh, pastor Bob Bolst, our current pastor, you know, we have Revelation programs, we have Jesus All About Life programs, and we have these school family members connecting, attending, and praise God, making decisions for him. That's great. Uh, I mean, in, in my time at the school, I have been overwhelmed to see non-Adventist staff members find Jesus and join the church. I've seen students do it on a regular basis. And to have that sense that we are daily living out that mission. Mm -hmm. and, and in my language, you know, I see the mission as not fishing in the shallow waters of, of, of a creek, uh, for souls to save, but in the deep ocean. And, and I feel that the school, and I th think Adventist education in general, can be that point of tension between a church that is seeking to understand and connect with the world and to, be, and to, to find people, and a world that is pretty disinterested in, in Jesus and God. I, I think schools are in a fantastic position to be that point of tension where we can welcome them in and show them Jesus welcome them in and show them there is a choice other than self-interest, you know, that they can find meaning beyond stuff or things or substances. And that's just exciting. Yeah, it's so exciting. It really is, especially in our Western culture, I think, you know, we just, it's, it's so easy to get wrapped up in, in other material kind of things. So oh, it's, um... without a doubt. And, and you know, we're, we're competing against mass media. We're competing against organised sport. And I'm not saying any of that is technically wrong, but as a church uh, and as we try and put Jesus, there are so many competing forces against us that it's about us being authentic. Yeah. It's about us... You know, my definition of authenticity is rather simplistic, but it's what you say, what you do equals who you are. And if we are going to portray that consistently, that will point people to Jesus because they'll see the words that we share and the things that we do correlate with us in our faith position, with us as being an Adventist, with us uh, being followers of a real Jesus, not a myth, not a legend, not, you know, some Obi-Wan force thing, but he's real. Yeah. yeah, he's living, he's real, he's in your school, he's in your hearts. He's, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Can you tell me, you've got your Bible here, is there any passage or piece of scripture that has inspired mm. you over the years um, in your role or as personally I, that you can share? I, I brought this Bible particularly because it's part of the object lesson, really. It, it, it's camouflage in colour because we're at war. You know, I think the one thing that I have fully understood the most over the last 15 years of, of senior school administration is that, that we are at war. That because we've put our flag in the, in the sand and we've said to the world, we want to be a light, we get noticed and, and tough stuff happens. 
Now, the text I want to read comes from Isaiah, and it's Isaiah 41, 8. And just to give it context, I don't probably have a, a particular Bible hero or heroine that I relate to, but I resonate with the children of Israel. I resonate with a bunch of grumbling, snotty-nosed, dirty-feet people that trudge their way through the desert and whinged and complained and questioned, even though they just walk through water, they follow a pillar of fire at night and a cloud during the day, they still are human. They still are imperfect. And I feel that I'm at the top of the list. But this particular text, and, and a few years ago, I was really struggling in my admin journey. And this helped bring me back. And where I say Israel, I actually replace my name with, and I put it in there. But as for you, Dean, my servant, Jacob, my chosen one, descended from Abraham, my friend, I have called you back from the ends of the earth, saying, you are my servant, for I have chosen you and will not throw you away. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. It is such a personal call of value that God is making, I feel, to me. And I wear these bands from three years ago from a week of prayer program that talks about knowing God and being his hands and feet. And probably in summary, that's what I hope Central Coast Adventist School represents. And I hope I get to support and be part of that process. Dean, it's such an inspirational story that you've shared. Thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. It's been fun. And thank you too for joining us here at Teachers Talk. I hope you can join us again next time. Mm -hmm.